All right, so for the focal pendulum problem, we just have to define a reference frame. So um, we're just going to define our I component to be east-west, and we're going to define our J component to be north-south, because that's what we need to measure. And we also have K pointing straight toward the center of the Earth, because that's where gravity points. And so uh, from the equation we have in class, we have the, ex uh, the acceleration for the fixed reference frame is all of this. Um, we can ignore the d omega, uh, d omega dt because we're assuming that it's a fixed rotation and we can also ignore the centrifugal force because uh, we know that that's uh, pretty negligible with it when compared to the uh, rest of the forces. Uh, and we also know from uh, Newton's second law that the uh, mass times acceleration is t plus the force of gravity because we have uh, the tension pulling up and gravity pointing down. And so we just plug these two, we just set these two equations uh, together, just do a substitution, and then we get uh, m times acceleration rotating reference frame is equal to t plus uh, mgk because um, uh, gravity's, uh, uh, gravity points in the k direction, and then we just have minus 2m omega cross v. Okay, so after reaching this point and having this, we want to calculate the Coriolis force. So we want to do what, find what is uh, omega cross V. And so over here you see we've broken up uh, the V and omega components. Uh, this is something we did in class on Friday uh, to find the different components of omega in the Z, the X, Y, and Z direction. Um, and then the velocity vector is just some velocity in the X, Y, and Z direction or as we rewrote it, uh, as the derivative of the r vector. Sorry, we should, right, yeah. Um, and then, so uh, we want to do omega cross b, so we just find the determinant of this matrix, uh, which is this given value over here, and we can see the different i, j, and k components. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, up use it to apply into this equation, except we're gonna break the acceleration in terms of the rotational reference frame into components as well. Um, and so that's how we get our work over here. So over here we're gonna we're breaking up the acceleration uh, in the rotational reference frame. Um, so we have uh, the force of tension and here we divide by mass because if you look over at this equation it's m times the acceleration. So we have um, the tension in the x uh, uh, the x component of tension over mass and then we have uh, tension y component over mass and tension z component over mass. So that's just our first term in this equation over here. And so then um, we will also now apply the components of the Coriolis force. So we have uh, these given values here. And in addition, in the z component, we also have gravity because gravity is going to just be acting in the uh, as a factor of uh, a sub z. And so then the next step is to realize uh, because of uh, small angle approximations, um, uh, basically the change in uh, distance for z is going to be uh, go to zero. Um, and so because of that, uh, a sub z is going to be approximately, is going to go to zero. And so uh, in that case, uh, what happens is the tension in the z direction uh, the over m is going to equal gravity because they're going to cancel out. In that case, uh, then we have this value is going to go to zero. And then also, um, because the, uh, the small angle approximation says the change of z is going to be zero, then this term also is going to go to zero because this term includes dr in the z direction over dt. So that's also going to be zero, causing this entire term to go away. And so then we can simplify that. So we have our uh, acceleration of the x, y, and z com components where z is zero, and then we are just left with uh, a sub x and a sub y with these given equations. All right, so the next step in uh, trying to figure out the motion of the pendulum is uh, finding out what these tension components are. And so uh, since we're assuming that the acceleration in the z direction is going to be approximately zero, uh, we can say that the tension in the z direction is going to be approximately negative mg, which is essentially the force of gravity pointing down. And, and in order to consider the x and y direction, um, we're going to, so we're first going to say the, um, the 
the the uh, the, the pendulum has uh, coordinates x, y, and z, and we're also going to say that the length of the pendulum uh, suspended from the top um, is going to have some length l, and so uh, we're going to say that the tension in um, the x direction is going to be negative mg times x over l, and uh, this makes sense because um, if we consider a simple pendulum, um, in the in the case of the simple pendulum, we just had the um, tension pointing this, we had the tension pointing towards the top and then mg pulling down. And so we had mg times the sine of theta, in which the, uh, where theta was the angle between the, um, the vertical and the uh, actual pendulum. So we know that mg sine theta is going to be uh, mg times x over l, since we can approximate sine, uh, sine of theta to be um, this, uh, x direction divided by L, and we could do a similar thing for Y, <coughs> and for Z, we, um, it's kind of just um, using uh, what we already had, so negative mg uh, times L, um, L minus Z over L, where um, since we know that, L, since we're going to be using a long enough pendulum, this um, this uh, portion of the equation is not going to matter as much. So uh, after we substitute um, t equals negative mg times x over l and ty equals negative mg y over l into, back into these original equations right here and right here, uh, we're going to get that a in the x direction is equal to negative g times x over l minus two omega dy dt sine of alpha. And we also have that a y is equal to negative uh, g y over l plus uh, two omega d x d t times sine of alpha. And so the issue with trying to solve these equations is that we have uh, the acceleration in the x direction depending on the velocity in the y direction, and we have the velocity in the y direction depending on the, uh, the velocity in the x direction. Okay, so now we're gonna approach trying to solve these two equations where we have some kind of form for already. So we're going to transfer this into the complex plane. So what we're going to do is we're going to say s equals x plus i y, where, um, and so therefore s prime equals that, and s double prime, etc. And so we're going to use this. And so first we're going to add x uh, double prime plus i double plus i times y double prime. And so you just make this up. You just multiply uh, this equation by i. And so when you add them together, uh, you get this following equation where um, if you can see, uh, we've already factored out x plus i, y because that's what our definition of s is. And so um, in this term, uh, it's just simple negative g over l times x plus i, y. However, for uh, this term, uh, when you factor it, it's i, x prime minus y prime, but uh, that, that value is the, the same as i times x prime plus i, y prime, which is the form we're looking for because that's our definition of s prime. So then, um, we use these three equations to simplify this equation. So s double prime equals negative g over l times s minus 2i omega sine alpha s prime. Because remember, we got that extra i from using this kind of substitution for i x prime minus y prime. Um, so then we know that in general, an equation, uh, a solution for this type of equation is going to come into the form of s uh, equals s naught, or just some constant uh, uh, that's not important right now because. Uh, it will eventually cancel out time, in, times e to the negative i omega t. Um, so then we find the derivatives of this. So s prime is this equation, s double prime is this equation. We just simply do that by just taking the derivative of the previous equation. And so then we're going to substitute these values of s, s prime, and s double prime back into the equation up here. And the result is this long equation here. Um, but there's a lot you can do to simplify this because, as I said, the s naughts are going to cancel out because they're in each of the three terms. Um, so you're left with this, and then as well as the e to the negative i omega t, um, well, you can divide that out. So you get omega squared equals negative g over l plus 2 omega sine alpha times omega. Um, uh, cap omega and uh, lowercase omega make sure are different. I, so I should be using a different word to say that. But uh, you can see that this is in the form of a quadratic. So we just rearrange it, and so it equals zero, and then we can use the quadratic formula, uh, which you can see I've used over here. So 
uh, 2 capital omega sine alpha plus or minus the square root of 4 capital omega squared sine squared alpha plus 4 times g over l over all over 2. Um, so you can take the fourth out uh, of the square root and that's going to be a 2, so all the 2's cancel. Um, so also, uh, for the same reason why the centrifugal force, uh, we ignored that, is because omega squared is going to be a negligible size and is going to be uh, approximately 0. So that means the square root will just be g over l. So then we get the value that omega equals cap omega sine alpha plus or minus the square root of g over l. All right, so to finish up this um, solution, so we know that this, um, this omega value, there's going to be two possible solutions. So we know that s is going to be some, combina is going to be some combination of those um, two solutions. So we have uh, s is equal to some constant c0 times the first solution, so e to the negative i times omega, which is um, omega sine alpha plus root g over l times t. And then we have the other solution is um, e to the negative some c1 times e to the negative i times omega sine omega sine alpha minus root g over l times t. And then so we can factor out the um, e, to the, uh, e to the negative i omega sine alpha t. And then, so in order to find the period, we can um, just simply look at one of the components. So if we look at the x component, we can just uh, take the real part of s, and uh, to do that, we could just take the cosine of this entire expression. And so it turns out after you simplify everything, you're going to get some constant a times the cosine of omega times sine of alpha t times the cosine of um, root g over l times t times t and so after that we can uh, we know that the root g over l times t is going to be um, it's just it's just going to be a component of just the swinging back and forth while the uh, alpha omega times sine of alpha t is going to be the actual uh, rotation of the pendulum over time and that's what we want and so we know that the uh, so we know that the uh, period of cosine is 2 pi uh, to pi radians, so we can um, solve for the magnitude of omega uh, using this equation. So we know that um, omega times sine of alpha times t is going to be equal to 2 pi, so we can just have that, uh, we can just solve this. So after we measure, um, we're able to measure the uh, precession speed of our um, of our pendulum, so we can we can uh, measure this directly. We know our latitude, so that means that we can solve for omega simply by doing some simple algebra. So we know that omega is going to be equal to two pi divided by sine of alpha, which is so sine alpha being our latitude, and then times t, where t is the uh, period of um, the pendulum as we observe it.